Okay, this is going to be Principles of Adult Learning. And topics we're going to discuss here are going to be pedagogy versus andragogy, physiological variables, psychosocial variables, motivation, learning disabilities in the EMS classroom, learning theories. An EMS educator needs to be familiar with the principles of adult learning. Learning styles means responses and expectations of adults differ from those of younger students. An educator can develop techniques to enhance student comprehension. This chapter is an overview of how adults retain information. First of all, we're going to talk about pedagogy versus andragogy. Andragogy is pretty much the science of teaching adults, whereas pedagogy is the science of teaching children. Whenever we look at this in general, pedagogy, all of these are new aspect skills of learning. So it is directed in a one-way, kind of a one-way street from the teacher to the student. Now, andragogy should be kind of unilateral, whereas the instructor should allow for life experiences, their interaction between both the instructor and other students. Adults, pediatrics, or children. Basic assumptions of andragogy. Autonomy and self-direction, uh, problem-centered orientation, life experience, goal orientation, and then other characteristics. And we're going to talk about these uh, each in their own section. Autonomy versus and self-direction. Uh, adults expect independence or certain amounts of autonomy, which means um, they're independent. Um, so assignments were given, they have freedom, legroom, so to speak. Uh, they like to have control and feel comfortable taking control of their learning. Uh, give them a little bit of input in their learning. Adults approach education with an expectation of learning new skills and knowledge. Educators should expect more criticism from adult learners as well. So they have generally an investment in this. They are paying out of their own pocket. Uh, and they're going to want to see uh, new knowledge and education, uh, essentially. Problem-centered orientation. Adults are relevancy-oriented, so is this even relevant in my education? They need to know why they are being told to learn. Uh, they are problem-centered rather than subject-centered. Life experience. When a person reaches adulthood, he or she has naturally accumulated life experiences. An instructor can draw upon these experiences and incorporate them into the instruction. All members share information and experiences with one another. The educator should strive to keep the class communication multidirectional. This is going back to what we saw earlier in that slide. If this is the instructor and this is the student, this is another student, very simply, communication should be unilateral. Uh, discussion is the easiest way to make the uh, the adult learn. Uh, an educator should strive to keep the class communication multidirectional, and that's what this means. That it is moving both ways, not just from instructor to students. Goal orientations. Adults are pragmatic. Uh, they want to be able to apply the information they learn immediately. So if they learn it tonight, they would like to apply it the next day. There's no magical area that which a student switches from pedagogical to andragogical learning. So they still may be, and this is developmentally within the student, they still may be in a ch in a childlike state of uh, learning or education. Uh, transitions varies from individual to individual on this. And there's no magic switch whenever that switch is over from pedagogy to andragogy either. Other characteristics. Adult learners typically display characteristics that can be divided into two broad categories. There is physiological, and these are the needs or the characteristics that adjust learning, and they're psychosocial. Even though adults are more diverse than children, physiologically, psychologically, and sociologically, the educator must keep in mind the individuals very broadly. And they may not be psychologically or sociologically developed enough. They may be immature. They may be not 
willing to take that next step of learning. Physiological variables. These are some of the variables whenever we talk about um, the body and what it requires to actually learn appropriately. Uh, lighting, task performance, adjustment to external temperature changes, and then distractions. We'll talk about each one of those. First of all, lighting. Provide adequate lighting to ensure older students can view presentations and take notes. Um, as everyone gets older, your senses decrease, so be sure that the lighting is adequate in the room. Task performance. The older the learner, the slower the reaction times to visual information. So if you're trying to get instantaneous thought and feedback from them off of visual presentations, their response times could be reduced. Uh, this may reduce the ability to quickly process visual information. Dep and this depends on how old they are. We're not talking about senior citizen aspect. Just as life goes on and you get a little older, uh, they have slower reaction times. Adjustment to external temperature changes. Comfortable temperature and environment settings are required. Making a room comfortable with adequate temperature control will add significantly to the adult's ability to learn. Distractions. Digital devices are pretty much a way of everyone's life uh, these days. However, depending on the age of your students or, or where they're at in this new social development, uh, news and social updates can kind of be intolerable to older students. Uh, universal ideas and universal rules on this. For example, uh, you turn your phones on vibrate and please answer them at breaks would be an example of this. This way that there's no distraction to, to older students. Psychosocial variables, success, respect, critical thinking skills, practical limitations and considerations, and we're going to talk about each one of these in turn. First of all, success. Educators must strive to create learning situations that we give the highest opportunity for success, and we don't want our students to fail. We actually want them to succeed in whatever they're wanting to succeed in. Uh, do not embarrass the adult learner. There is That isn't so much fun. Um, praise in public and criticize in private. Not every clinical may go well, so they may have a they may have had a bad day in the clinical setting. Objectively reflect their performance and determine how improvement can be made. You have to be able to uh, also tell them in this what their grading criteria is for this evolution, and this is where rubrics will come into play and be assist assisting in this. Respect. Returning to school is a big decision for the adult learner. It generally represents an investment of money. The adult learner expects and deserves to be treated with respect. Critical thinking skills. The adult learns best by adding new information to an already existing framework. Has great difficulty remembering isolated facts that don't attach themselves to some of the framework that's already in play. The educator must seek the most effective approach to developing and presenting course materials. Know your student's background. Linking new to old will be the easier way. So if you can find any common ground to their education, linking the new education to that in some form or fashion will be, will be helpful. Practical limitations and considerations. The following are limitations on the student. Scheduling changes, scarce time, financial stresses, conflicts between job and family responsibilities, and then transportation problems. Very simply, they have to be an adult about it. If their schedule is challenged, provide as much flexibility as you possibly can so that they, su they can succeed. If it is not within your abilities to provide that much flexibility. Then let the adult student know. Everybody's time is scarce, including the instructors. So be sure they're managing their time wisely. Obviously financial stresses. The college itself is going to want its money at the point that you're halfway through or three quarters of the way through or all the way through the paramedic education or whatever education that you're, you're, that you're teaching. Conflicts between job and family responsibilities. Most people require to have are, are required to have a job <clears throat> that way that they can pay rent food 
gas, and so on. And then family responsibilities in that as well. Transportation problems. As we get older and we don't have public transportation from point A to point B, our car can break down. Uh, our car could get repoed, which would be a lot more of a problem. Um, things like that. So transportation problems may arise as well. But these are practical limitations and considerations for the adult learner. <clears throat> motivation. Uh, when we look at motivation, we look at intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So this whole section is on how to motivate your students. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this is a more of a scientific approach or a scientific look at what motivates individuals. Uh, honors, positive affirmations, and then barriers to learning. Intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. They're divided into two groups. An intrinsic motivator are internal drives for behavior, such as desire to help others or to serve the community. So these are, these are motivators that you yourself already have in play. They may just need to be flourished or, or tilled a little bit to, to bring them to the surface. Uh, extrinsic motivators come from outside the individual. Uh, personal, person examples include the possibility of promotion, bonus or additional vacation time. So this is an outside motivator, but if you could get a promotion, a bonus, and some vacation time all out of the same uh, action, then why not, right? Most people would actually go for that. And extrinsic is what that's called, external. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Abraham Maslow is pretty much the pioneer in the field of human motivation. Also the father of modern leadership. Uh, Maslow worked on his hierarchy of needs over a period of years from 1943 to 1971. Maslow believed that a person strives for higher potential and desires to reach the level of his or her calling to become a fully functional person or to achieve self-actualization. Now this is the upper, upper extreme of this, or the upper level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's theory consists of basic human needs and then growth needs to be attained only when the basic needs have been met. So what that means is, is we're going to look at a pyramid here in just a second. This is figure 3-3 three, three in your book. The pyramid itself, the very bottom foundation to this pyramid, is essentially physiological needs. Safety, a roof over my head, food in my belly, uh, transportation, and then we kind of go up from there. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about this here a little bit on the next slide. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this right here is biological and physiological needs. So air, food, drink, shelter, warmth, sex, sleep, etc. So all of these would be our needs. Safety needs. Uh, protection, security, order, law, limits, stability. So all of these are within safety needs. Belongingness, family, affection, relationship, uh, work group. So you're pretty much accepted, and you're you're given. You have relationships and have affection given to you. Uh, esteem needs. We're going to stop at that one for just a second. And I'm going to talk about all of this here really quick. Uh, esteem needs will be things like achievements, status quo increases responsibility increases, and then your overall reputation. Now, what Maslow's theory is suggestive of is that you can never get to this level here if you don't have all this. So at the moment that you have the biological and, phys and physiological needs, then you have the ability to go up to the next tier. And to it, once you work on this, then you have the ability to go up to the next tier. Once this is done, next tier, and so on, and so on, and so on, until we pretty much reach. Now, this is the ba the basic model kind of stops here at cognitive needs or self awareness. However, you have aesthetic needs too. So you have beauty, you have balance and form, self actualization personal growth and self-fulfillment. So at this point here, if you are self-actualized, you pretty much have the keys to the castle. You understand how things work. Uh, transcendence, helping others to self-actualize. So 
transcendence would be like to help a buddy that you saw that was here kind of tear up those last two steps if possible so again most employees that we see ha we have a problem with kind of have a problem around this area here they may never get off of tier 2 or they may be working back and forth between tier 2 and tier 3 as soon as they get up a little bit they get knocked back down honors honors can be a two-edged sword some programs every student gets recognized for something to avoid any student being left out uh, criteria for granting awards must be s disseminated in advance so rules of engagement on these awards need to be given well, well in advance if done appropriately professional awards can acknowledge exceptional performance careful consideration should be given to presenting awards and or uh, the end of class certificates positive affirmations positive affirmations are highly effective methods to increase levels of performance in stressful situations they're also the most underutilized motivational technique used in EMS education today um, more experienced educators know that the students attitude is the most important factor in training and very simply if someone's doing a good job tell them they're doing a good job so hey you're doing an awesome job very good today we do need to talk about it though and then whenever you have them in private you can apply I like what you were doing but I need improvement in these areas here and tell them what areas those are barriers to learning not all learners come to the classroom adequately motivated common barriers include their family career responsibility the resulting lack of time money or confidence and the educator should understand that such barriers exist and they make they may be able to affect positive change in the students through their role as a mentor or guide and an advocate so you're the you are the advocate for their education you are the guide for that education very simply if you understand what barriers might be in place from their perspective you might be able to help those students overcome those barriers learning disabilities in the EMS classroom uh, learning disability is defined as a neurobiological disorder that affects the brain's ability to receive process store and respond to information learning disability criteria now dr. Sheldon a Torowitz pretty much help us out here with a definition on a learning disability in addition to that there are some criteria that you should be looking for whenever you think someone might have a learning disability so before you start finding these signs and symptoms of a learning disability on them be sure that you, they make this criteria here at least average intelligence capacity uh, so at least an average intellectual capacity I said intelligent but intellectual capacity a significant and unexplained discrepancy between achievement and expected potential so these guys look like that the, they are gonna rock but they don't well why don't they the exclusion of mental retardation emotional disturbance sensory impairment cultural differences or a lack of opportunity to learn should all be applied central nervous system dysfunction as a basis of the presenting problem now that's the criteria if you if you have that criteria then you can apply this learning disability assessment or if they have these then they should be looked into possibly as having a learning disability and what we're seeing here on this these next couple of two or three pages are the signs and symptoms of a learning disability often spelling the same word and but spelling it differently within the same document uh, reluctance to take on reading and writing tasks oh, I'll get to it pushing it off to the last minute um, and then all of a sudden not fulfilling what they needed to do uh, trouble with open-ended questions on tests weak memory skills difficulty in adapting skills from one setting to the other slow work pace this is the next page here continued um, poor grasp of abstract concepts so if you give them a thought process that really isn't written in concrete that they can't it's just kind of abstract it's kind of out there 
to where they have to put the con the pieces together themselves, they may have a poor grasp of it. Inattention to details or excessive focus on them. Uh, either they could care less about the details or they're going to be almost OCD about details. Frequent misreading of information. Trouble filling out applications or forms. Easily confused by the instructor. And then poor organizational skills. Accommodations for learning disability. Now, if you have policies and procedures that are already set up, please apply those. But the, if you do not, these might give you some ideas on policy and or procedures to develop that would assist students with learning disabilities. Uh, extended the time when the exams might be an option. Uh, private space for the written tests so that they can kind of decrease on the amount of distractions. Tutoring. A note taker to assist. Audio recordings of the lecture. Uh, and then alternate assignments for them. Uh, learning theories. Now these are several learning theories and understanding the learning theories is kind of a good thing because what it will do is it will give us a spot that like okay I, I can see where this learning theory might be applied or I can apply multiple learning theories to this individual here because they fit into multiple categories and we'll kind of explain this as we go on. So there are self-directed learners then we're going to talk about the theory of margins, transformational learning, experiential learning, and then context-based learning or situation situated cognition. So self-directed learning, let's talk about it first. And pretty much it is what it says. It is self-directed. So self-directed lear learning involves many related concepts. Self-planned learning, self-teaching, independent study, uh, distributed learning, and then distance learning are all within the self-directed learning. Self-directed learning theory can be applied by creating two elements institutional process or an internal process. And pretty much self-directed learning is what it, what, it, what it says it is, that this is the learner and pretty much they know how they learn. They are very well good at self-management. Uh, they understand how they learn and they can evaluate or self-monitor their own learning. So this would be like the perfect student. Theory of margins is our next theory that we're going to talk about here. Um, there are, this is also called the theory of power load margins. So power, pretty much, in this theory is the ability or the resource to carry the load. And the load is defined as the demands, both self and social, how much learning the student needs to accomplish. And this would be the load that you place upon them. Uh, margins, the difference between the power and the load. And our job as an instructor is is to mess with the margin. Uh, an educator job is to try to give the tools that would increase their margin of power. The greater the margin an individual has, the more likely that they're going to succeed. So this is the theory of margins, and this is from... McCluskey's theory of margins. Right. Same right here. All right. And this right here uh, is the load. Let's talk about it first. So you get the load from work, home, life responsibility, and other internal and external pressures. The instructor can also load the student as well with with homework and papers and things like that. The power is your ability to handle the load. Power is the ability to deal with the load. So again, you have more work responsibilities, internal and external pressures, and this equals more load. And the learning margin is how you apply the power, so to speak. So. The learning margin equals the area between the load and the students have the ability to learn. And this is a this is a picture that I actually found on Google, so thought it explained it pretty well. So one more time, this is going to be the load, your ability to handle what you put placed upon your own shoulders, and the margin 
is how much cushion that you have in here because what you don't want is a margin that's thin as a, as a piece of paper. Transformational learning. Learning that initiates and creates deep and lasting personal changes. And whenever it creates a deep personal change, it's called a paradigm shift. So we've essentially, I hate to use this euphemism, but we've essentially changed someone's outlook or almost changed someone's maybe religion by teaching them this. Now, this should kind of be a goal. A lot of people come in with bad habits and the bad habits are hard to get rid of. Uh, these are based on concept, meaning perspectives, one's overall worldview, uh, meaning schemes, smaller components, specific knowledge, values, beliefs, and one's experiences. Now the paradigm shift occurs whenever you've essentially sold them on the product. And the product in this is essentially your education that you're giving them. Now. I've got some illustrations coming up here in just a second of a paradigm shift. Now, the pictures that are here, there's two ways of looking at these pictures. Now, the point is, is that we should probably get, we should get all students to look at the overall larger picture. That way we never get some money that can't see the forest because they are focused on one tree. The transformational learning is is getting all of their knowledge base together to where they make empirical they look at the empirical data and make good clinical decisions. Now I'll kind of go over these. So if you're looking at it from this guy here one, two, three. If you're looking at it from this guy here, one, two, three, four. So each person has a different perspective on this. Now, with that said, I would much rather a student, instead of saying there was three or saying there was four, look at the overall view and make a very simple educated decision. Same way with this. This is a picture and it asks what do you see by shifting perspective you might see an old woman or a young woman. Well in the young woman this is the top of her hat, this is her eyelash and her nose, and this is her chin, and this is a necklace. Whereas if you see an old woman this is the front of her hair an eye here and an eye here and this is her whole nose her whole nose and then this is her mouth so it depends on your perspectives on these these are called a paradigm shift now as far as transformational learning goes at the point that we have given them enough information to where they can make their own logical assessments off of the clinical data that's there that should be our paradigm shift or the student's paradigm shift. That should be transformational. All the bad habits are gone. We've corrected things. They look at things very logically and they make great clinical decision. Experiential learning. Learning by doing. And I love this type of learning. This type of learning creates muscle memory and what muscle memory is, is it gives you a spot to fall back on your training if you're ever in a very stressful situation. So the steps in this are experience, meaningful reflection to see the, see the experience from several perspectives, abstract thought, and then follow to derive concepts and key ideas from the experience. And then you get it in your mind. You see it one time. You get to apply it one time. You let that soak in and you get your head wrapped around the science behind it and then you deliver it again to where the muscles then will take over. This is why I like to call it muscle memory. This is experiential learning and there's a crucial spot in this which is this right here. So the person themselves, the situation or the experience 
if the person reinforced but relatively unchanged, we're still about at this level. What we want to do is we want this to be very, very simply, we want this to be ingrained because this experience needs to be a good one. So if they do things right and memorize correctly, the person has an experience that kind of changes them. And if they're allowed to reflect on it a little bit so that they can all kind of put it away where it should be, and the evaluation is good with peers, then the practice becomes a lot more ingrained in them. Then it's useful. If they don't allow that, then what occurs is, is we get essentially an unchanged element, which that's not what we want. We want to develop good habits instead of bad habits. Context-based learning or situated cognition. And this is a type of experiential learning, so again, experience. Uh, assuming that information is more easily learned if it is taught within an environment where it will actually be used. Now, this works somewhat, but it creates a familiarity. Uh, examples of this would be EMS education programs that allow or have a ambulance that's built into their laboratory bay. Um, this would be a good way of actually uh, running mega codes and running things in there. Uh, educators should try to make every case scenario and workshop as realistic as possible. And this gives us a, a, a certain amount of familiarity if you will. So this is problem-based learning, context learning, and since being in the environment, we have a problem analysis, kind of direct our own learning in this. From our interaction with our peers, we get brainstorming solutions, and then if it seems feasible, we can test the solution in this. And this is all from this type of experiential learning. In summary, Principles applied in the teaching of adults vary from those used in children. Differences must be taken into account if success is to be achieved. Educators must be familiar with the physiologic and the psychosocial variables common to adult learners. Understanding of learning theory is going to aid instructors in a practical application of these techniques. If you have any questions over the following chapter, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith. I can be contacted at smithr.imsa.net or 405-219-7613. Thank you.